We're turning to God's Word again in Luke chapter 2, uh, picking up where we left off a couple of weeks ago as we looked at part of the story of the birth of Jesus. Uh, we looked at uh, the announcement to the angels back earlier, uh, by the angels to the shepherds back earlier in chapter 2. And so we're going to pick up at verse 22 this morning and uh, consider uh, the, the events that happened immediately after the birth of the Lord Jesus. I wonder how you react to a new baby. What do you think? Do you look to see whether they look more like mum or dad? Uh, I tend to notice whether they have much hair or not. Maybe that says something about me. Um, but we all, we all react to babies, don't we? And there's the sort of immediate, aren't they cute, uh, sort of stuff. Uh, but do you wonder what the child will grow up to be? Do you think about the world that today's babies will live in? Do you wonder how different their life will end up being to the life that you've lived? Certainly having children of your own forces you to think about the world after you're gone. Uh, it's amazing how much the arrival of a baby can make us look forward as well as looking back. And uh, we've just read uh, from uh, Luke's Gospel part of the Christmas story that is so easily overlooked. And it happens just in the couple of weeks after he is born. Uh, and yet, uh, even though it's another 30 years until he'll call his disciples and a few years more after that, that he will die on the cross. Even though all of that is still far ahead, there are people who see what's coming. Uh, there are people who see Jesus the baby and know what he will be and know what he will do uh, because God has revealed that to them. Uh, there will not be time today, I'm afraid, to Think about Anna, the prophetess, who we meet in verses 36 to 38. You might want to ponder those verses later on today. But we're going to look at Simeon, uh, this holy man, this righteous and devout man, probably uh, quite an elderly man, as he expects uh, that his own life is coming to an end. Uh, there is... No doubt in my mind that he would never have seen the cross just from the things God has said to him and uh, the way that he responds to seeing Jesus. All those things are for a future he will not get to experience in this life. And yet he knows for certain that seeing Jesus is seeing salvation. Now here Simeon is in the temple. The Holy Spirit has ensured that he would be there as Mary and Joseph take Jesus to dedicate him to the Lord. And contrary to what all the famous artworks of Jesus' life show to us, he and his parents didn't wander around with a glowing dinner plate behind their heads. You would not have picked them in the crowd. <laughs> They would have been another couple with another baby turning up to the temple amongst the thronging crowds of people, talking, praying, sacrificing. And yet here amongst the crowd is Jesus, the most important of them all. And as Simeon sees him in the crowd, he looks at the baby and praises God saying, I can die now, my eyes have seen your salvation. And what puzzling words. How could he see in Jesus, in Jesus, not Jesus on the cross, not Jesus risen from the dead, but Jesus the baby, how could he see the salvation of God? And what do we see? And what do we see as we look at Jesus? Do we just see a baby? Do we see a lovely sentimental story, maybe a myth? Do we see a wise teacher who maybe is worth listening to some of the time? Now, what do we see 
when we see Jesus. My aim is to help us all to trust that seeing Jesus is seeing salvation. And so we need to look at these verses to to draw out what we can see about Jesus here. And there are three truths we're going to look out for there in our bulletin, there our outline for today. We need to see how Jesus is dedicated to holiness in the first few verses. How Jesus is bringing consolation in the middle. And finally, how Jesus is sacrificed for salvation. Those are the three truths about Jesus we're going looking for today. So let's look at them together. First, in verses 22 to 24, that Jesus is dedicated to holiness. And not not too surprising looking at these verses when we understand what's going on. Uh, The purification rites and the, the dedication, the consecration of the firstborn child to God was supposed to happen in every family, especially to the firstborn. The reason goes back in history to the Exodus. Remember, as the Egyptians refused to let God's people out of slavery, God kills the firstborn in every Egyptian family. But he passes over the people of God who have the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their house. The lamb takes their place as God's judgment passes over And so ever since the Passover, the firstborn son is dedicated to the Lord. We notice in these verses, don't we? Luke is emphasising again and again that what Joseph and Mary are doing is to fulfil the law. It's in obedience to God, bringing these sacrifices to fulfil all that God had commanded. And that's worth noticing because we cannot fulfill the commandments of God. We cannot fully obey them. We can try. But think of just a few of the Ten Commandments. Have we ever told a lie? Have we ever wanted something someone else has? Have we ever hated someone or been angry with them? Have we ever lusted for someone? Or blamed God for something that is wrong, something that is evil. It's only just a handful of the Ten Commandments. And when we look at ourselves and our hearts honestly, we can own up to all of them. See, when we're born, we may have been cute, but we were not good. None of us needed our parents to teach us to put ourselves first or to lie or to get angry. But Jesus is different, isn't he? There might be times in our lives when we seem to be all right, but Jesus is always perfect. And the pattern of obedience that Luke notices here is the pattern of all of Jesus' life, all the time whether people notice his actions or his attitudes or not. He could say in John chapter 5, verse 19, whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Because he is the eternal Son of the Father, he is truly dedicated to God, not only because of these sacrifices, this ceremony of dedication, but Jesus is perfectly Obedient, perfectly dedicated to God. So where does that leave us? If our best efforts to keep God's law, to be good, are not good enough, well, what do we do? Well, Jesus has an answer, doesn't he? Because secondly, we see Jesus is bringing consolation In verses 25 to 28. The more we realise how serious our rejection or ignoring of God is, the more we need consolation. That's the word that's used here in verse 25. It's about comfort, isn't it? 
And not the comfort of kicking back on the couch, but the comfort of a long, caring hug. Uh, the comfort of someone assuring us it will be okay. That kind of comfort is the consolation Jesus came. It was what Simeon was looking out for, the consolation of Israel. See, as God's people, we don't just float above the troubles of life, uh, ignoring them, uh, tucking them away as if they don't matter. The trials and tragedies and disappointments that afflict other people come at us as well. Jesus assures us in John 16, we will face tribulation. Now, even uh, Paul could say that he was burdened beyond his strength. And as believers, we're all called to weep with those who weep. These are realities. We don't get to say, keep calm and carry on. Keep a stiff upper lip. Don't pretend it doesn't affect you. God's people look for real comfort and consolation and we find it in Jesus. But where else might we be looking for comfort? Uh, what makes us feel peaceful? Now think about your life. When do you feel secure? When life's going well, how do you explain that? Is Jesus in the answer somewhere? What distracts or bothers you when it's not right? What do you daydream about? What do you fantasise about? When there's trouble, where do you turn? Where we find comfort is the end of this sentence. Things would be better if only... Whatever goes in the end of that sentence is where we find consolation. If only my family was not the mess that it is. If only work was not a nightmare. If only there was more to make ends meet. But Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel because of the promises God had made. Promises to rescue Promises to bring real help. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, God has promised there would be a solution. In Genesis 3.15, he talks about the one who would be born to crush the head of Satan, the tempter. And Kathy read for us in Isaiah 40, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. And then later down in verse 9 of Isaiah 40, we find that the good news can be summed up in these words, not here's how to be better, not here's how to try harder, but here is your God. That God himself was coming to comfort his people. That God himself was coming to pay for their sin. That he would deal with our guilt and shame. That he would come and take it away. That even though we are not holy, he would bring consolation to us. Is that what you need? Simeon knew that's what he needed. Uh, look at, at what he'd been told in verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, these are, that's an incredible promise, isn't it? Uh, as well as all of the promises in Genesis and Isaiah and all those other places, Simeon had a promise for himself that he would not die until the anointed saviour came. And even though Jesus is just a baby at this point, Simeon can take him in his arms and say, I see your salvation now. So he praises God. You've, as you've promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Simeon could praise God because everything God said was true. He would give light to us in our darkness. The things we want to hide, he exposes and then forgives as he reveals himself, the one who saves. So like Simeon, we can turn to Jesus for consolation. When trouble comes, we can say things will be good because of Jesus. That what I really need is the saviour God has sent. And so we can praise him. Because as we see finally, Jesus was sacrificed for salvation. Verses 29 to 35. Uh, Like Simeon, we can rejoice because of the peace Jesus brings, a peace that is stronger than death itself. In verse 29, Simeon is ready to die because salvation has been achieved or will be achieved by this child. He could die in peace because the Saviour, the Messiah, has come. Is that peace yours today? But notice this isn't just a good message for Simeon, is it? It's not just for those who've heard that they would see the Messiah before they died, but Simeon goes on to praise God that this salvation is not only for him. It's not only for the Israelites, it's for the nations, it's for us. That Jesus shines in the dark, lighting the way for Jew and Gentile to be saved. we could stop there and start drawing conclusions. And what would we come up with? Well, we could say, well, if only we become like that baby, we'll be saved. If only we become innocent like this little child, we'll find our way to God. And yet that's not good news, is it? None of us can roll the tape back and hit record again. And start off erasing our sin and our past. But as we said, even as babies, we were already self-centred. So how is the birth of this baby good news? Look at the comments that he then makes to Joseph and to Mary in verses 33 to the end. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon can look at God's promises in the past, but he also looks ahead to Jesus' destiny. Jesus is destined to divide, he says. Some will rise, some will fall because of how they respond to Jesus. Some will speak against him, revealing our hearts. And so how we respond to Jesus, whether we embrace him as our comfort, as our consolation, as our salvation, whether we trust him to be our holiness, or whether we ignore him, is the main thing. We may look good, but unless we embrace Jesus, we will fall. But Simeon looks forward. Simeon looks forward to Jesus' destiny, to what will happen. And he shows us that by how it will affect Mary there at the end of verse 
35, not only will Jesus cause division, but he'll bring what happens to him will bring sorrow to his mother. A sword will pierce your own soul too. He's looking right to the end of the story, isn't he? As one day the very core of who Mary is will feel as if it's been shredded to pieces. As her son dies. As he dies even though he'd done nothing wrong. And that is Jesus' destiny. That is what he came for. Remember where Simeon and Jesus both are. They're in the temple. They are where the sacrifices are made. And yet Simeon realises here in this child is a greater sacrifice than the millions of goats and bulls that were brought to the temple. The sacrifice we need to take away our sin, to pay our price, to deal with our guilt. Remember Adam and Eve, as they fell into sin, God had to cover them with animal skins, showing the only way to get rid of sin is for someone to die. And yet Simeon sees in Jesus a greater sacrifice. We read in Hebrews, he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Or in Romans 3, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. That's the destiny this baby faced. And at the other end of Jesus' life, Luke brings us right back here to the temple. In Luke 23, verse 45, as Jesus is drawing his last breath outside the city, Luke whisks us back to the temple. Here, as Jesus dies, the huge, was it 70 foot tall curtain in the temple is torn from top to bottom, as no human being could ever do. A divine declaration, you can come to God through Jesus. Your sin is taken away by faith in him. You're welcomed into his holy presence through Jesus. That's why... Simeon could look at this baby and say, my eyes have seen your salvation. Because that's what Jesus came for. That's why he was dedicated to holiness. That's how he brings consolation to us. Because he was sacrificed to save. And that sacrifice is ours when we ask for it. When we tell God all we've been hiding and ask him to take it away and make us right with him. So let me put it in a nutshell. Seeing Jesus is seeing salvation. Because when we ignored God, Jesus was dedicated to the holiness we could never achieve. Because when we are guilty and ashamed, Jesus brings the consolation we long for. Because Jesus was sacrificed for the salvation we need. A salvation to be received by faith. So how do you respond to Jesus? Do you welcome him? Do you ignore him? Do you see him as your salvation? How do you react to Jesus? Let's pray together. Merciful God, You did not have to do any of this. 
You didn't have to come and promise and suffer and die. But by your grace, you have given yourself to us in firm and confirmed promises, given and signified, fulfilled in Christ, at the greatest of costs. How amazing that you would achieve the holiness we could never achieve. That you would bring the consolation, comfort and hope that we long for by giving your Holy Son to be the Saviour, to be sacrificed, to be all that we need. Our God, may these truths be our hope, our certainty, May they help us to face life and death with peace. And may we most of all find certainty and consolation, not in the things that are passing away, but in Jesus who is eternal and always lives to advocate on our behalf. Our God, how we long for this salvation to shine in our town, in our families, across our land, around our world. The people in the darkness would see the light of Christ and in seeing Jesus would see salvation. We ask it for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen.